So welcome back, everyone. Thank you for continuing on with us here at Generation Analog. Uh, I am pleased to be able to introduce uh, our keynote, Elizabeth Hargrave. Uh, Elizabeth is the award-winning designer of Wingspan, Mariposis, and Tussie Mussie. Her experiences breaking into the board game design world have also led her to become an advocate for increasing diversity and inclusion into the board game world. And I will take it over to Elizabeth uh, for her keynote. Thank you so much. Hello, hi everybody. Let me just share my screen. So uh, when the conference organizers reached out to me, I talked about how I didn't really do research in this space particularly. So, but I have a lot of questions that I would love for other people to do research on. And they said, great, that's, that's the perfect topic. So here I am. Um, I am going to share a little bit of information about things that we know um, within the board game world, but um, I'll probably ask more questions than answer them. Um, just a little bit of background about me. I have a master's degree in public policy and had a, a pretty long career doing social science research and policy work here in Washington, D.C. Um, and when I started working in D.C. in the mid 90s, um, participated in a bunch of activities around women in health policy because um, we were outnumbered in that world in the mid 90s. Um, and within decision makers, that's still true that um, it's about a 60-40 split within um, health policy, male, female. Um, and a little bit after I came to DC, I started playing uh, hobby board games, mostly in private groups in people's homes with a lot of straight couples. So it was like really 50-50 men and women. So imagine my surprise when I broke into the larger board game world, started going to more events, started getting into the design world. Um, it turns out it's much more um, skewed towards um, male than the, my experiences in the health policy world ever were. And so um, it, it really struck me. Um, and then my policy analyst brain starts asking lots of questions about like, why are things this way? <laughs> what, what is really going on here? Um, and so that's a lot of what I want to talk about tonight. Um, so these are some of the sort of high level questions that I want to talk about. Um, I think we don't even have great demographic information on board gamers in general. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the work that Tony Kabuda has done on designers um, as sort of one snapshot of that world. Um, publishers could be another snapshot and sort of, sort of what is that demographic profile? What's even, what's the baseline? How is it changing? Um, and then a whole separate set of questions about how can we speed up that change? Um, I worry that the demographic skew may actually be affecting the types of games that get made. Um, and I'll talk some about that and why I think that. Um, and just larger questions about what makes people think games or gaming in general are for them. What's keeping people away? How can we grow the hobby? Um, and then one final quick little section just on a question that I'm curious about on whether board games bleed, which does tie into some of these issues as well. So starting out with just what's the demographic profile of board gamers? Um, there have been some surveys that are just sort of general, like put it out on social media and see who answers um, kinds of surveys and so not particularly rigorous methodology in terms of trying to be uh, super representative, but they do end up having pretty similar demographic profiles by gender, um, which is that um, usually somewhere around 25% of the survey um, is women. Um, this is over several different years. The most recent one that I pulled for this presentation is 2019. I'm not sure if there's been something since then. Um, and then I have the helpful little bar just to remind us that that is half of what the world population of women versus men is. So um, women certainly underrepresented, underrepresented in the populations that are answering these surveys of are you a board gamer? Uh, a couple of years ago for a presentation that I did for Tabletop Network, 
Um, I actually reached out to a bunch of Facebook groups about what their uh, demographic profiles looked like, partly because um, Jamie Stigmeyer had pointed out that the Wingspan Facebook group had many more women in it than as a proportion than his other groups for his other games. Um, and the sort of general interest board game groups on Facebook were in that same sort of range. Not sure what's going on with the fans of Gen Con page. <laughs> Somehow they've got more women, but um, a lot of them are, are again in that 25%. For individual board games, I didn't throw the slide in here, but there's a there's an even bigger range with some of them being kind of like the range of 5% women. Um, and I did not get information on non-binary gamers, although Facebook does collect sort of another category um, now. So I'm sorry, I don't have that on this slide. I didn't get it from all of these groups, but it is possible to know that as well. And I, I, for the ones that I've looked at, it's like, you know, one to 2% in addition to what you're seeing here. Uh, there's less information publicly available about race and ethnicity data for board games. Um, the pie chart here on the left is from Paul Booth's survey that he has published in a couple of different places, including a book that he put out recently. Um, and you know, I'm just comparing it to the US population because that was the majority of people who answered his survey, although not the entirety. He did have international gamers as well. Um, so his survey found 87% white um, and everyone else fitting in this little, what is that, 13% slice. Um, whereas if you look at the US population as a whole, it's only 60% white. So again, just um, pretty dramatic underrepresentation of other demographic groups. And I think that resonates right with most people who have been to big board gaming events. This would have been at Gen Con. This is a picture from Gen Con in 2019. Um, and almost everyone in this picture is a white guy, which was my experience going to Gen Con. Although I will say I I noticed a difference going between like say 2016 and 2019. 2019 was was the first year that I had to wait in line in the women's bathroom, which was like a sign of progress to me. Um, but uh, there was this quote from a few years before that from Ajit George talking about how, you know, going into the Gen Con convention space, he saw almost no one who looked, I saw almost no one who looked like me by far the most visible minorities at Gen Con were the hired convention hall facility stuff. It felt like I had stepped into an ugly part of a bygone era, one in which whites were waited on, waited upon by minority servants. Um, it, it is a weird feeling if you haven't experienced it to walk into this large a group of people and to be this like visibly outnumbered. I didn't look into literature around that phenomenon for this presentation. I'm sure it's been done. It would be very interesting to see someone sort of pull some of that literature from sociology and psychology about what is what happens in situations like this and um, what effect it has on people who are in a visible minority um, and how that translates and, and is experienced in the board game world. Um, I know Tanya Pabuda did interview a lot of people for her dissertation, and it may be one of the things she talks about tonight in the next panel, so stick around for that. Um, and this is about the point when I always like to say, you know, I am not saying that any of those people in that picture need to go away. Every one of them is, I am happy to have them be playing board games, but my question is how do we bring more people into that room? How do we grow the universe of gamers? Um, and, you know, I, have we even measured the universe of board gamers? I, I worked for a survey organization for a long time, so I sort of think about survey structure a lot and like, how do you even find people in any kind of um, more rigorous way than just throwing things out in the world and seeing who answers? Um, and there are some captive sort of populations, right? Like you could be gathering demographic information about your convention attendees. Board Game Geek could be gathering it for their users. Um, I think I heard that one of the online board game platforms, I forget if it was Tabletopia or Tabletop Simulator, is gathering demographic information about their users, but they're not releasing it publicly, but perhaps researchers could get it from them and look at things over time. Um, how are things changing? Like, what, what's the baseline? Are things getting better? 
But the thing I think we also need to keep in mind about all of those sort of well-defined populations is that they are small subsets of the, the much larger universe of people who play board games. And how do you get a sense of like, what is the population who are just playing a few games at home? If we think they are gamers, it would be great to know about them. I suspect that that sort of home-based gaming universe is probably more evenly distributed in some demographic characteristics than that like intense Gen Con crowd, right? But um, I don't know how we measure it. I'd love for people to figure that out. Um, I know some people have done some work around historical factors that have contributed to where we are now um, in terms of like specific gaming cultures around specific games like Magic the Gathering, um, like war games. Um, I think that that is, you know, an area that is is ripe for attention and especially in terms of identifying what of those historical factors that caused the, the demographics that we see now, what, what of those factors still persist and um, where they have been broken down, how did they get broken down? Um, we do see some venues that are more diverse than others. And I think there could be some really cool um, sort of case studies about individual game stores that are doing really well or conventions that are doing really well and bringing in a broader um, audience. Labyrinth Games and Puzzles here in Washington, DC is one of the my most diverse game spaces that I have ever been to. Um, I feel very privileged to call them my local game store. Um, but as a women-owned business, it is in the heart of DC, which is a majority minority um, city. And they do a, do a good job of outreaching to the community and, and bringing new people in. Um, there's probably a lot of other questions you could ask about like what has worked in other industries that started at skewed and brought in a, a broader user base over time and what does that look like and how does that translate into board games. So thinking next about um, game designers and here's one of Tanya's slides um, from her dissertation looking at um, the, the universe of 400 game, the top 400 games on Board Game Geek, and each designer counts as a single observation from each game. So there are designers that are in this pie chart more than once because they have multiple games, and there are games that are in this pie chart more than once because they have multiple designers, but that universe of, you know, more than 400 games times designers, um, you end up with 93% white men as the designers in that population. Um, so a little sliver of white women, a little sliver of um, men who are black or people of color, um, and Nikki Valance who has three games and is a white non-binary designer. Um, so clearly, clearly not representative even of the population of board gamers. Um, I've been thinking a lot also about the, the geographic distribution of designers. Um, you know, we tend to compare the demographics of gamers and of designers to wherever we live, but it's important to remember that um, there's a whole other world out there. So I, I just pulled the country of residence as well as I could for the designers of the top 100 games on Board Game Geek. Um, and they were entirely from North America, Europe, and Martin Wallace in Australia. Um, and the first game that shows up is like number 114. So not in this sample as a um, cartographer, as a designer from Brazil. So he, that's the, the first game as you go down the list that's from South America. So if you did a larger sample here, you might pull in these other um, continents. Um, but I do think that just looking at the top 100 gives you a certain sense of how skewed, um, at least the, the board game geek view of the board game world, how skewed it is compared to the population of the world as a whole. And the population of gamers, right? There are gamers on every continent. Um, 
so I often like to sort of present this super simplistic model of this pyramid where you start out with a population of board gamers on the bottom of the pyramid, right? And then some subset of them become designers and some subset of those people who try designing a game actually make it through all the hoops to, to get their game published. Um, and one of the questions that I have is whether the designers at the top of that pyramid who've gotten a game published, did they, is it just a time lag does that does the population of designers that we were just looking at in those pie charts is that just like what the population of gamers looked like 10 years ago say because it takes some time to work your way up this pyramid or are there things that are weeding people out in that transition from becoming gamers to becoming designers are there things that are weeding people out from designer to getting published that are disproportionately affecting underrepresented groups so that the white men are more likely to, to work their way up even given a certain population of gamers. I don't think we know that because we don't really understand what the population of the base of the pyramid is, but um, I think it would be a really interesting area to, to try and get some, some more data on. And then what are the barriers that are keeping people out at those different stages in the process? Um, I'm super curious about what we're going to see over the next decade in terms of how the board game market is growing worldwide. Um, on Kickstarter, I'm not sure if it's still active. We just were seeing um, the African Board Games Convention uh, raising money to, to throw a convention in Nigeria. Um, and this is not just pulling people in as gamers, but they have a whole track that's aimed at uh, doing playtesting and, and pitching games to a publisher that, that's working in Nigeria um, and maybe other publishers too. I haven't looked that closely into it, but I, I think we're going to see more and more of this. And, and you know, there are certainly convention and conventions and publishers happening in Latin America now and Asia. Um, I find it odd that we're not seeing more cross fertilization from some of these markets into the US and European market. And I'm really curious how that might happen over time. There are a bunch of different um, programs that have started up aimed at getting underrepresented folks into the design world. Um, and I think there could be really interesting work done around evaluating those, figuring out what's working, what isn't working, um, are, are those programs succeeding in getting people hooked into board game design, getting them published? Um, and if they are successful, what are sort of the key components of their success and how do we replicate that? Um, I'm also really interested in what's happened in the last year and a half during the pandemic in terms of pitching. A lot of publishers have moved their pitches online. Um, and I'm wondering if that has removed barriers for certain designers. Um, pitching at conventions certainly um, is not cheap and requires most people to take time off of work to do it. And um, it just intuitively to me seems like it's possible that um, online pitching could be just one super easy way to to remove some of those barriers for underrepresented designers. But have we actually seen that? I don't know. And then I, so I'm not super active. I'm not active at all, actually, in the role playing world. But my impression has always been that the, the designer pool in that world, especially in indie RPGs, is more diverse than in board games. But I don't know if that is true or if people have looked at that. And if it is true, it would be fascinating to hear some of the history there and, and why that is. So moving from gamers to designers to publishers now, um, this is my totally unscientific poll of <laughs> board game publishers. Um, but it is, you know, I did make an effort to sort of pull the names of some of the larger companies in the industry. That's not super easy to pull because they're most of the um, private companies. We don't actually know how large they are, but you can get a sense from their games, um, which also don't have great information. So that's a whole other topic to study. It's like, how do we even track what's going on in the board game market when so much that the information is not well aggregated? But um, 
or publicized. But um, this is just my slide of like, okay, you thought that designer chart was bad. Um, this is, you know, all white guys except for the head of Simon. Um, there's been some really cool studies done by the Annenberg Inclusion Initiative, looking at the movie industry and the music industry. And I sort of had this vision that someone could do similar things for the board game industry, like actually go out and ask publishers, like not only looking at the CEOs, but also their staff. Like what are the demographics of the people in the publishers? Who are the decision makers? Who's like getting, who's reviewing game pitches? Who's making decisions about art? Um, those sorts of questions. Um, and does that spill over or correlate with um, the demographics of the designers that those publishers are working with? Does it spill over into what their games look like, who the characters are? Does it spill over into what their customer base looks like? And is there any difference between like the bigger publishers versus sort of small startups on average? I think that could be really interesting. The, the this is the, movie study from Annenberg, they go all the way back to 07. Um, there isn't a lot of a trend there, it turns out. <laughs> um, but uh, but that's like super useful to see, right? That um, how things are changing or not over time. Uh, one of the things obviously that is probably going into some of the, the underrepresentation in Publishing is just the, the level of capital and connections that it takes to start a successful working company. Um, I think there could be more done around like what does that actually even look like in the industry historically and now like is Kickstarter changing that? Is that, if Kickstarter is changing that, is that diversifying who is publishing? Um, there's a whole set of work that could be done there. And then Gana has started this diversity, equity and inclusion initiative like what should they be doing like what are publishers already doing to diversify what supports do they need um what's working what isn't um there's a whole set of stuff around that and, and that's um an effort that just started formally at gamma last summer so it's it's new and and it's something people could sort of track almost from the beginning at this point So one of the places I go from, from that set of like what we do know about the demographics of the industry um, is thinking about like, does that, what does that mean for the games that are getting made? And are there correlations between the demographics of the people that are making games and, like, and um, what games are getting made? And it's based on, some data that was put up by Quantic Foundry sort of showing that there are some correlations between things like gender, between gender is the one that they've published and um, gaming preferences. So you may recognize this chart as a thing that was sort of making the rounds on social media a few years ago, everyone was taking this quiz. You can still take the quiz on the Quantic Foundry website, um, board game preferences quiz or something like that. Um, so they have tens of thousands of people have taken this quiz at this point. They say they have like prevented duplicates, but who knows if that's true. Um, and like the other surveys that we've seen, or I think this was actually one that I included on that bar chart, you know, 73% men, 60% North Americans. So um, possibly representative of the uh, board gaming population, or at least the board gamers that are doing board gaming things on social media. Um, and what they have published on gender is that for these different, um, you know, they have these eight different uh, sort of parameters or that, that are like things that might motivate you to play board games, the things that are important to you about board games. And on average, uh, people of different genders on average are more likely to prefer some of those parameters over others. Obviously there's tons of variance within gender, you can have women who are like super aggressive war gamers and men who are total care bears. But on average, um, men are skew in one direction and women skew in another. So one of the sets of stuff that is different is, is 
um, that women are on average less motivated by conflict and social manipulation. They're things that they enjoy less in games and they are more likely to say that they enjoy cooperation or just playing games to be social and fun. Uh, women are also less likely to say that they're really driven by like exploring this strategy in board games or um, that like the discovery process of learning new games, learning um, how to be good at them. Um, women are more likely to say that they just want a game to be easy to learn and teach. That, um, they seem more um, supportive of having a lot of chance in board games. So these are all things on average that are different um, between men and, and women. I didn't put them in these charts just to keep them simpler, but, but Contact Foundry actually did find some interesting things about, about non-binary preferences, which are different from both of these binary genders um, in terms of sort of uh, being really motivated by uh, story and sort of exploration and things like that, characters. I'd be really curious to see data like that split out um, by race and ethnicity or by country of origin. Um, you know, historically we've talked about, you know, games as Euro games or Ameritrash, which are like, you know, geographic designations, sort of schools of design that are, that were traditionally associated with geographic regions. I think those boundaries have really blurred over the last several years. Um, but are there still sort of schools of game design and are some of those geographically based? And I'm thinking about the games that I've seen coming out of Japan, which feel different to me. Like, I, I think that you could do some, some interesting work sort of looking at um, the characteristics of different games coming from different places. And, and is that correlated? Is that because people in those places have different gaming preferences? I don't think we really know. So if you looked at my first survey, I am a total Care Bear gamer. <laughs> but do the, my question is really, do the games that are getting made reflect the preferences of that larger market that's 25% women? Or do they look more like a population of game designers that's 96% men, right? Um, do, do game designers tend to sort of flow with that average for their group on average? Um, do publishers tend to go with the preferences of their demographic group on average? Um, and the reason that's so interesting to me is, you know, I feel like we could be in this feedback loop, this sort of chicken and egg, where like if most of the games are made by white men and most of the games that they are making sort of appeal on average more to other white men um, because of those um, preferences that, that track somewhat with um, demographics, then over time, those games are going to on average bring in more white men than other demographic groups. And you just get in this feedback group where like if those are the people you're bringing in as gamers, those are the people that move their way up that pyramid and become designers. Um, and you know how do we break out of that cycle? My belief, but I would love to see people do work on this and I'm happy to be proven wrong, is that um, if you bring in a more diverse set of designers, they will bring more perspectives to the table and possibly make games that then appeal to a broader audience um, and start to break us out of this feedback loop. So several questions about things that you could study about what, what makes people think that gaming or a specific game is for them or not? Like what are things that are sort of gatekeeping in the hobby um, just structurally? So one of them is representation. Um, these two uh, pie charts are another thing from Tanya Prabhuda's dissertation that she shared um, in a recent presentation. Um, so she also, in addition to looking at all the designers, she looked at the covers of a bunch of board games, 200 games, and counted up all of the human figures on 200 game covers. Um, so, you know, in the case of Power Grid, there's one person and through the ages, you're counting all these people on, on the cover. Um, 
and again, totally skewed distribution. So you end up with 77% men on covers. You end up with 83% white people on covers. And here are some key examples that I think of as like classic Euro game covers, total white dude energy. Um, all games that I actually love, right? But um, not necessarily the the face that we want to show the world if all of the faces are white people, white men. There are some notable exceptions. I felt guilty after I made that last slide. So I, I pulled some of the, the examples of board games that clearly put some thought into who they want to show on their cover and um, what effect that might have. So, yay. But we do know that, um, you know, from studies in other media, we know that lack of representation can drive down consumer engagement. So there was a survey of women about their TV and movie watching. Two thirds of women had said they had stopped watching a show because it used negative stereotypes of women at some point. Um, and a quarter of women said they had stopped watching a show just for a lack of women characters. And in, among younger women, it was like half of them had stopped watching a show because it didn't have women in it. So does that translate into board games? Uh, there's also been work done around um, consumer movie watching behavior and there's a correlation between the percentage. This is true across a bunch of different ethnic groups. I used the, the black um, chart, but um, as the percentage of, of characters in the movie um, sharing your own race or ethnicity goes up, you are more likely to go see that movie. Does that translate into board games? Um, I do think we're seeing representation changing over time. Um, some of those like really nice covers or more recent games on the Netrunner just goes back a ways now. Um, and it would be really cool to document that, that the um, publishers are paying more attention to this and, and being more thoughtful about it. Um, I keep thinking it would be really fun, but possibly very expensive to do a study that uses sort of the, the A-B testing technology that you see in like Green Inbox and the folks that are doing like um, targeted ads for, for Kickstarter campaigns and things like that. Um, where like if you showed different people different cover art in ads for games, would you end up with um, different groups of people preferring um, that are like would be would women be more likely to show interest in games that have women on the cover, for example, things like that. I think that could be really cool. But again, like if it involves buying uh, Facebook ads or something, maybe prohibitively expensive, but it's worth thinking about. Um, and I think a lot of publishers, you know, would be happy to to push the envelope on some of this stuff, but they could probably use more guidance on like what works, like how what are best practices if you if you do want to be intentional about representation in your games. Um, another set of stuff I think about in terms of like, is this keeping people out of the hobby is just um, the tendency of hardcore gamers to prefer complex games, which I am guilty of myself. Um, but it's something I've become really aware of um, around Wingspan because in the hobby board game world, Wingspan is not a particularly heavy game. Um, in fact, you know, when it won a bunch of awards, it got criticized for like a light game winning the Kenner Spiel, for example. Um, but within people who have not played board games before, Wingspan is like impossibly difficult. <laughs> um, and I think we we forget that we lose sight of that at our peril. Right, we, we need to keep this in mind. Dinesh Vani did this work where he, um, so you know in Board Game Geek, each game gets a complexity score. It's a crowdsourced thing. People can say, I think, you know, on a scale of one to five, this game is this complex. 
Um, and Dinesh plotted the complexity score against the average rating for a game uh, and found that on average games with a higher weight score, there's a tendency for higher weight games to get higher ratings on Board Game Geek. And he put together this interesting list this is a couple years, several years I, I dated at this point, these are the 2018 top games. But if you sort of adjust for complexity and, and artificially flatten out that line, you end up with a very different um, top 10 for the board games on Board Game Geek. And, and it's a lot more games that I think of as sort of gateway games, right? To get to ride patchwork code games, um, a lot easier to learn than things like Through the Ages and Twilight Struggle and Terraforming Mars. But if you look at Amazon, the top rated strategy and war games are even simpler, right? You're looking at things like Five Crowns and Skip Bow mixed in there with Catan and Ticket to Ride. Um, so again, just something I mean, we th I think we need to keep in mind um, as we think about like, who is a gamer? Um, who are games for? Like, I love the heavy games, but we need to make sure that we're um, bring new blood in all the time. And, and these are the games that are going to do that, I think. Um, so those are some of my questions, right? So first of all, and then backing up back to even the measure of complexity, there are a lot of people who think that this crowdsourced me metric on board game geek is maybe not the best way to do it. And I, I think there's some cool theoretical work that could be done around like what actually makes a game complex. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and how does some sort of objective criteria of complexity overlap or not with um, new gamers finding that game accessible um, and something that, that is a good introduction to the hobby. Um, I'd be curious about that, um, that complexity bias chart and whether the, the angle of that line has changed as Board Game Geek membership has grown significantly in the last several years. Um, my impression is that old school board game geek users are even more skewed toward, toward those heavy complexity games. Um, but it also may be something that just like, as you stay in the hobby longer, you get more and more engaged by that, that level of complexity. So there's an interesting set of questions around that. But then what, what I'm really interested in as a designer is like, what makes a game a true like gateway game? Like if you asked a bunch of gamers, what game got you into the hobby? What was your experience like? How easy or difficult was it to learn? And what can we learn from those types of questions about um, helping new gamers have a good experience with, with more board games? So with Wingspan, our solution to the problem that a bunch of birders were coming in and being totally overwhelmed was we, you know, the first thing you have to do in Wingspan, right, is you, you choose out of a hand of five cards which ones you're going to keep and which ones you're going to throw away. What we did is we said, okay, here are four starter hands. We've already made that decision for you. And here are your first four turns. Just do these things. Don't worry about it. You don't have to make any decisions right away. But once you've done these four turns, you should have a good sense of how the different actions work and be ready to start making decisions on your own. Uh, and we've heard from a lot of people that that really helps. And I think it's something that you could do in a lot of different games. Another thing I just like to prod people to, to remember when we're thinking about like who gets involved in this hobby. So time and money are real barriers for a lot of people um, and can have a gender and racial aspect to them as well. Um, so if you look at, this is just top 10, I did this super quick, but top 10 games on Board Game Geek versus those top 10 games that I was showing from Amazon, the Board Game Geek games are like twice as expensive and th take three times as long to play, right? And this is with Gloomhaven mixed into the, to the Amazon list as well, which, which certainly brings those averages up. Um, so just something to keep in mind. And you know, this is inevitable with any hobby, right? As you get deeper into it, and more serious about it, you're going to spend more time and money. But I just, I like to remind people of this sometimes. Um, the US Bureau of Labor Statistics collects time data where they have people like report what they're doing every hour of the day. And on average, um, 
within the US, men have an extra hour of leisure every day compared to women. They also work more hours, but like the other stuff of running households and all the other stuff that happens in life, um, women do more of that and it more than makes up for the difference so that men end up having actually more leisure time. And I have always wondered if this is a piece of the puzzle with the gender skew in board gaming. Um, anecdotally with some of my friends that is possibly borne out. Um, and you do also see uh, variation in the amount of leisure time that people spend um, by race and ethnicity. Um, I like to use this picture of my friend Sarah, who's my friend who taught me Power Grid many years ago, um, has probably not played a hobby board game in years because she has two little ones and um, has no energy at the end of the day to, to think that hard. Uh, so I think there's a whole set of interesting research that could be done about parents in general and what effect children have on gaming habits. Um, and you know, secondary to that is, is that effect skewed by gender? Are moms more likely to drop out of the gaming world when they have children? Um, and are there any venues that are doing interesting things with childcare? Is that, is that a thing that might increase diversity in the board gaming world. I remember being very struck when I went to Essen that, that it seems like a much more kid-friendly convention than any of the conventions that I have been to in the US. Um, but I don't have any data on like, is then the population that go to, goes to Essen um, notably different from the population that goes to US conventions. Um, and then on the money side, are the so we have all these awesome resources in the board game world where people are just willing to share their games right libraries game stores themselves um other board gaming clubs and meetups um and are those resources being used by people who otherwise wouldn't be able to afford to play games um it could be an interesting set of stuff around that and like how can we use those resources to bring bring more people into the hobby on the design side, um, I, just, I feel like board game design is this very like niche luxury hobby in a lot of ways. It's almost entirely done on spec, right? Like you're design, you're putting in all the work up front before you ever know whether you're going to get paid for your game. Um, and I think you could do a, a lot sort of describing that phenomenon, how much time and money are people putting into developing their first game? Um, and is it something that really looks like a luxury hobby? Like what's the average income of a first time game designer? Not from the game, but like who, who's, who are the people who are becoming designers? Um, how many game designers have children when they start designing? Um, or our children are, and like the, the energy and time that they take, like a barrier to entry for design. Um, I think a, a much smaller question, but along the same lines, some of the mentorship programs that I mentioned earlier, just give participants some cash. How are designers spending that? And it, is that a signal of like what some of the financial barriers are? Um, to becoming a designer? Are they spending on going to conventions or um, prototypes or like what's helpful to them? Because we could do more of it. So my last little set of questions um, is do board games bleed? And this is, you know, bleed in the role-playing game sense of, you know, when you're done playing a game, does it spill over into your, into the rest of your life? Um, and there's lots of work being done sort of around educational games, especially in the video game world, and like, and, and behavior change games as well. So things that are, have been intentionally designed to educate or change people's behavior. Um, there's a couple big conferences around that stuff. I know there's tons of work being done. Um, there was a panel earlier today about games and education, specifically for board games. Um, but I'm really interested in this question in terms of how it relates to games that aren't particularly intentionally designed as educational games or behavior change games. Um, and the first thing that got me thinking about this was Wingspan, which 
all these people have become birders who never paid attention to birds before. Um, and I can't say that that entirely wasn't my intention. It's, uh, birds are something that I love. I wanted to share the love of birds with other people and hoped that they would appreciate them too. Um, but the fact that they're like actually going out and buying binoculars and going burning and like starting e-bird lists and, and like really becoming birders um, has been just remarkable to me. Um, and then I saw this little post by someone who actually planted a butterfly garden after playing mariposas, which again, like I wanted people to know about the monarch butterflies and they are certainly, you know, on the brink of being listed as an endangered species. Um, but mostly just like the amazing migration story was what I wanted to get across. And that, um, I have had more than one person share a picture of the, the butterfly plants that they have planted after playing mariposas, which blows my mind. And I posted about this on Twitter and some other people sent in examples like visiting national parks because they had been playing parks. Um, so these were like real world actual like behaviors, like people making effort and spending time on things um, specifically because of an experience they had playing a board game. I think it's just remarkable. Uh, and then that leads me to have other questions about where this might be happening, right? So back to the representation question, um, just the way a board game represents different genders or ethnicities or fail to represent them. Does that affect player attitudes outside of the game? Like if you spend a couple hours um, ex experiencing and interacting with the ideas of people in a, in a certain way, like could that bleed into the rest of your life? Um, I always use the example of Catan for environmental questions of like, you have the, all these board games where resources are pretty much unlimited, you know, Stone Age, right? Like just, you just got to do the stuff to get the wood and the ore and like you can just infinitely chop down the forest right and does that spill over into players attitudes towards environmental questions um without us realizing what's happening uh, and then colonialism is one that's gotten a little bit more um attention just in terms of like not so my question is not only is colonialism sort of something that I don't particularly want to engage in as I am playing a board game, but is it possible that when you do engage in um, a system where the, the, the whole game is designed to sort of reward you for colonizing, could that spill over into players' attitudes on historical foreign policy or current foreign policy? Um, I would be happy for the answer to everything on this page to be no, it does not matter. <laughs> Um, but I don't think we know, and I think it would be really interesting to study. Um, so those are all the questions that I brought, and um, thank you so much for your attention and thinking about these things, and I would love to hear your thoughts and questions back to me. So there are a few questions already in the Q&A. Um, that we can look at. So Jason Gonzalez asks, can you think of any games that are geared toward diverse groups, for example, various ethnicity or gender? Yeah, so um, I'm going to blank on their name. There's a board game company that was Board Game Brothers, and now I think they're uh, Colorways, Game Lab, something like that. Omari Akil is the, the, one of the designers there. Um, so they designed a game called Rap Gods that is uh, very specifically like immersed in African-American rap culture. Um, they're working on a game called Hoop Gods, um, which is very intentionally diverse around basketball. Um, there are others. What, uh, there's a dungeon crawling game that had all female characters. Um, there, there are quite a few games that have, have been very intentional about it. Um, yeah, so it does happen and, and some of those games have, have been quite successful. Yeah, One Deck Dungeon is the one I was thinking of, thank you. <laughs> 
So another question is, are there any studies around the idea of gaming deserts in the same sense as food deserts? In other words, is there a lack of gaming presence, fewer uh, uh, favorite local game stores, gaming groups, et cetera, in more diverse communities that continues to feed the disparities we see in gaming audiences? I could see how a need to travel to less diverse communities or stores might dampen enthusiasm for the hobby. Yeah, that's a great question, especially, you know, when transportation is an issue and parking and things like that. Um, right, I, uh, I, given that people have to spend a lot of money on board games, I, I would expect board game stores to be located in higher income communities. So uh, yeah, I think that's a great thing you could look at. Libraries are probably one way around that. So yeah, that would be super interesting. Yes, definitely. And there's been lots of talk on the in the chat throughout um, the day and uh, in the Discord about uh, the crucial role that librarians play in, in all of our lives. Are there other questions? We still have about, you know, eight, nine minutes. I can ask a question while people think of some new ones. Um, Elizabeth, thank you for this amazing talk. Um, uh, a big question for me is you, you went through all these structural reasons um, that uh, women and people of color don't get more involved in hobby gaming. And I guess for your own story, how do you think that you managed to navigate around those structural barriers? What, what are the advantages or tricks or maybe allies that you had in your core that really helped move you through those things? Um, I think my experience was fairly typical to a lot of women who have gotten involved in the hobby and stuck around, which is that a good chunk of my early time was um, just gaming in people's houses, like with my friends and not experiencing some of those um, overwhelmingly male spaces um, right away. And then I was totally hooked and didn't care after a certain point. <laughs> Um, and once I started designing again, I had to sort of push through walking into, you know, play testing spaces that were really, really skewed male. Um, but I was kind of hooked on this idea I had for wingspan and how to make that work. And so I, I just pushed through it, but you do have to push through. I think most, most women and people of color would tell you it's, you can't, it's it's hard to ignore. Yeah, absolutely. So we have uh, two more questions in the chat. Um, so some of your questions you posed regarding family or gender and source of designers in gaming when talking uh, U.S. versus Europe, we can um, we can I can feel like I feel can be answered with a consideration to the cultural significance of gaming in Europe versus the U.S. Do you feel that this is something shifting with the rise of more hobby games in more mass market stores? such as Target or Barnes and Noble in the US? Yeah, I don't know what's driving it. I mean, I think the, the causation there might be flipped. I think the, the board games are ending up in Target because their popularity is growing maybe more than the other way around. I don't know. Um, but yes, it is definitely growing quickly in the US and sort of this you know, geek culture, Big Bang Theory thing going on of um, people doing geekier things. And then the pandemic has definitely, definitely grown interest in board games. So I think there's a lot of factors, um, it, but you're right that it, the Europe has sort of a higher baseline of, of interest in board games than the US did. And the US is sort of playing catch up on that. Another question in the chat is, uh, do you think that making board games for kids is a good solution to bring girls and black people into the hobby? That's a good question. I don't know. It's something I, th I think, again, like asking the people who are in the hobby how they got in would be one way to get at that. Um, I don't know. I'd be curious to hear what other people think. Um, it's certainly something that we've seen traditionally that um, designers of children's games 
are more likely to be women than designers of hobby board games, but they are still overwhelmingly male. Um, so it's like less skewed, but still quite skewed. So thinking about all the questions that you've raised here, how are you adjusting your own design process to kind of address these issues? Um, definitely thinking about the on-ramp and like how, how do you create something that has enough complexity to really be of interest as a hobby board game, but still like a gentle on-ramp for someone to learn it. That's probably the biggest thing. I haven't had people in any of my games yet, so um, that dodges a lot of representation issues for sure. Um, I'm going to jump a little bit around just because this one kind of directly relates back to your own experience. Um, since uh, you mentioned walking through those mostly white male playtesting groups, um, this person's curious if you felt like there was more resistance to your games which don't necessarily match the games showing up on the BGD top 10 list. Although I think they should, but that's me. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, at the time, I didn't perceive it that way. Um, I did have someone tell me I was gonna have to change the theme of Wingspan because no publisher would publish a game about birds. So that's a fun story. <laughs> um, and I do think that the, the theme, I didn't really talk about theme, but I do think theme, could be a piece of it. Um, and that's a whole another area to look at, right? Uh, just a couple more questions. So is there research on representation in games designed for children, tweens, teens? This could be an excellent source of bringing up of bringing in a more diverse audience into the board gaming world. Yeah, that's a great question. So Tanya was, um, you know, in, in several of the charts that I borrowed from her was really looking at that, you know, core hobby board game geek audience, but you could certainly do the same sorts of studies for other categories of games, like more mass market, more aimed at children. That would be super interesting, yeah. In response to the survey asking how important various qualities of a game are to different demographics, um, are there any qualities we should be asking about but aren't? Are those categories of experience comprehensive or already skewed? Oh, that's a really good question. I don't know how they came up with that. Um, and I've seen at least other one other study I didn't reference it in this presentation. It's been a few years since I looked at it, but uh, of people sort of trying to construct from the ground up uh, some a framework of like, what are the important things to ask about? Um, yeah, I mean, that's uh, the Quantic Foundry set of stuff is certainly one of, of many different ways that you could do it um, and, and definitely ripe for study. Um, my question is, how do you get enough people to answer your questions to make it really meaningful. It's tough. And I think this will be our last question. Um, looking at an area of diversity that we haven't actually uh, talked about tonight, uh, do you think that there is some disparity in terms of religious belief among gamers in comparison to a wider population? Um, could they be more or less religious? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Yeah. Um, And how would that spill over in terms of people feeling welcome or not at, at, at gaming events? I don't know. Or are they drawn to certain themes or certain types of games? Right, right. Right, right I've certainly heard people talk about, well, they're like, uh, Let's acknowledge like one of the major, major early and successful reviewers is Tom Vassell, who's quite Christian and who has guidelines about what he will and won't review around certain um, family friendliness guidelines. At least that's my understanding. I haven't really looked into it, but um, and I would be willing to bet that that has had a subtle influence on game sensibilities over time. Yeah, he's not reviewing something like Kingdom Death Monster, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. 
Okay, excellent. So we're just about out of time. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for, for this wonderful keynote. Thank everybody for who's still around. I, I know that people were posting in the chat and the Discord various uh, what what crazy time people are staying up or got up in order to in order to see this and be here uh, today tonight whenever. Um, so thank you so much for for being here and for your time. Um, this was this was absolutely wonderful. Um, and we will continue shortly um, with our panel at 7:30, which uh, Elizabeth kind of gave a little preview to a couple of times. Um, uh, so at 7:30, we will continue with. Panel four, race, representation, and colonialism in analog games. Thank you again for everything. Wonderful. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody.